Mark chapter 12. Again, this is his church. It's not my church. I'm just pastor in it. And so just like all of you, I have to obey what the head of the church, Jesus Christ, wants to do by a spirit. And so we had four songs prepared. We did two. And in the midst of it, God moved like he wanted to, and we made room. I don't really like that whole statement, make room, because I think that's kind of asinine that you think you're trying to make room for God. You should just yield all the time because he's always moving. Are you hearing me? And I never want to stifle the Holy Spirit and the move of God in his church. And it's obvious that the Lord needed to minister to you in a level today. And then also do demonstrations for others. Because the words you know, if not demonstrated, you don't know it. It's not enough to know about God. God told us that the works that he did, we can do. So we should obviously walk in the experiences of his word. It should not just be mere knowledge. And I'm thankful that we yield to the spirit of God and have the things that come with the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the spirit. And therefore the church today. And what's interesting is that whole teaching that Paul did was to one of the most pagan churches, period. When I mean pagan, these were, these were a group of people in one of the most pagan cities of, of idol worship that involved sexual immorality. And these people were moving under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, getting divine things from heaven. Are you hearing me? That was upon a bunch of people that were not apostles. So it's kind of a crazy thought when theologians try to act like the gift stopped with the apostles because Paul was explaining to a church before he was even there. He was explaining to the saints how the things were moving because they were doing and these weren't even apostles. They were just saints. So how could it have been done away with apostles when the saints are the ones that were moving with the gifts? So we should rightly divide the word of truth, correct? Are we in the church age today? Yes. Are people still getting born again? Yes. And people are still getting baptized in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. People can still move in the gifts of the Spirit to edify the church, to build it up. And the latter church is going to be better than the former church because the latter rain is coming for this church. Amen. As one minister said at the call to arms, I'm like, why didn't I use that sports more than the baseball? And that is when you're running a relay race with a baton. You do not put your slowest person last. You put the fastest guy as the anchor. So God's placed us in the earth as the anchor. We are the greatest generation ever. We have more power than any other one. We have more of an expression of the Holy Ghost than any generation that has ever preceded us. He's put in the fastest leg. And I'm telling you right now, it looks like the devil is passing the finish line first. But we're getting the baton. And we're going to smoke him. We're going to run him down and pass him. And leave no doubt that this church... The church of Jesus Christ is the best on the planet. Hallelujah. We are a victorious church. So we are just going to run it down. Amen. Glory to God. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34 it says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, this is Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all, say all, all your heart, and with all, say all, all your soul, and with all, say all, all your mind, and with all, say all, all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have stated, truly stated, that he is one, and there is no one besides him, and to love him with all your heart, say all. And with all your understanding, say all. all. The, and with all the strength, say all. all. And to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered him intelligently, intelligently, 
he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. The Luke account of this in chapter 10, verse 28 to uh, 20 or 25 to 28 says it this way. A lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Are you hearing me? With that being said, said, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, because Deuteronomy chapter 6 is where Jesus quoted this in the Mark account of Jesus stating this, also of the Luke account of which the lawyer stated it. It, came, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1. And Moses is talking to the nation because they're about to go into the promised land. And he's reminding them of some things. And he says, and this is the commandment the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going to going over to possess. So there are commandments, there are statutes, and there are judgments. He goes on and says, so that you and your son and your grandson might what? Fear the Lord. Because where the fear of the Lord is, there's wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. Well, fear the Lord your God to keep, say keep, keep. say keep. keep, keep all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you all, say all. all, all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all, say all, all, all your heart, and with all, say all, all, all your soul, and with all, say all, all, all your might. Now he reiterates this passage over in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. In fact, Tomorrow, when you get into your Bible reading, because we read the Bible here at Anchor Faith Church, we read it cover to cover every year from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21, and we get insight. And tomorrow you'll be reading Deuteronomy 10, 11, and 12, but we're going to get 11 in you tonight, today. Because this is really important. When I read over this, I'm kind of jumping ahead in my own Bible reading. And as I read this, something went off in my spirit which is why we're having this conversation today, which is why I'm not surprised of the demonstration now that has occurred. I said the demonstration that has occurred. So we know we are to love the Lord our God with what? All our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and to love our neighbor as himself. Now, why is this? Is that commandment still in play? In fact... Three of the Gospels use this quote. John's the only one who does not. And in Matthew, um, he obviously continues to quote this as well. And Jesus is saying in the Matthew account that all the law and the prophets hinge on those two. Which means if you do those, I don't care how many commands there are, statutes and judgment, you'll fulfill them. Now the question is, is that in play today? And it is, because in this dispensation, the church, are you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, yes. with all your soul, yes. with all your might, yes. and with all your strength? Yes. Well, obviously you would. Why? Because Jesus is supposed to be Lord of your life. And in order for him to be Lord, that means he's supreme in authority, because Lord is not a religious word. It is the, it is the position Jesus is as king. Yes. And Jesus is king, yes. right? Yes. We know Jesus came as a suffering servant. In essence, he came as the king who died so future kings could live. Right. Jesus came to sow himself. He said, unless a kernel of weed, a wheat falls, not weed, and wheat <laughs> falls into the ground. Okay? We need to edit that out, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> there are weeds, and they're not of God. Okay, a wheat fall in the ground and die. It cannot produce fruit after its own kind. So Jesus is the seed. In fact, the father in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam fell from dominion, he did not lose a religion. He lost access to the kingdom. Yeah. Because man was made in the image of God. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion or rule. When Adam ate the fruit, he lost his rulership. Yes. You hear me? Yes. And so Jesus came to restore. So God the Father comes in. Adam, where are you or what position are you in now? He says that he blames God because he's in sin and sinners blame God. Well, it's that woman you gave me. So he goes to Eve. He says, what have you done? She told the truth, said, I was deceived by the serpent. He goes to the serpent. He says, I'm bringing my seed. Yes. Yes. I'm bringing my seed. And I'm bringing my seed legally. Yes. Unlike you who have entered illegally and have received dominion from Adam, according to the Luke account, Luke chapter 4 of the temptation of Jesus, the Satan says, I'll give you all these kingdoms or domains in a moment of time for they've been handed over to me. Adam usurped or abdicated is, I mean, is the word. He abdicated his rightful place as ruler of how the world functions, how it was governed, how it was ruled. And he gave it to Satan. And the Lord says, man was to have that, not a fallen cherub. So I'll come back as a man. This is why Jesus has to come as a man, because God gave the earth to man. And as a result of that, he said, I'm going to put my seed in the woman, and he is going to crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And Jesus said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. What are the devil's works? Rebellion or disobedience. That's what he works, because if he can get you to disobey God at his word, he knows he cuts you off from the kingdom supply. Are you hearing me? So this gospel that we preach is not a gospel of going to heaven. It is a gospel of the kingdom coming to you. If you die, will you go to heaven? Yes. We're all going to be caught up together with him, but we will return with him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because the Bible's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring, and Jesus came to restore kings in the earth in their original intent as God designed. And so we see that the Lord says, listen, the reason you're in the mess you're in is because you're not obeying me. Adam failed to obey so sin, simply put, is not obeying God. He said, Adam, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for the day you eat, you will surely die. And he listened to the serpent's voice and his wife's voice and action of his wife and rebelled against God and ate the fruit. So here he says, now listen, if I'm Lord... You're going to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Jesus' message when he first preached, that's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, was repent, which means change your thinking. Yes. You got to change your thinking. Because your mind's not my mind. Right? We know that Isaiah said his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But we also know Corinthians says we have the mind of Christ. So he's like, you want my mind? You're going to have to get my kingdom. He said, repent, change your thinking for the kingdom. Not heaven, but the kingdom's at hand. Because the kingdom's functioning in its capacity in the heaven realm where God sits on his throne. Our Father, say our Father. That art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, your will be on as it is. So heaven never lost. Nor does sin exist in it. For when the devil came after the throne, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. But instead of Adam, which was made in the image of God, we say the first Adam, instead of him casting Satan out like his father did in the heaven realm, he ate the fruit. But a last Adam came. 
I said, alas, Adam Cain. And he restored to us this dominion that ultimately he holds the authority that the day will come that that devil of old, Satan himself, will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, the prison system of God's kingdom. So God desires his kingdom to function and manifest in this earth, but the only way his kingdom will do so is if we are walking in obedience to his word. Obedience to his word is what causes that kingdom to manifest. Again, your will be done, right? Your kingdom come, how? Your will be done. So if we do his will on earth, as his will is done in heaven, then we'll bring the kingdom realm or heaven's realm or how it functions and operates will manifest in the earth through our lives. So in Deuteronomy chapter 11, he reminds him, so this word, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is applicable today. Then the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it sounds a little different as Jesus progresses in his teachings concerning this. Because, you know, one of them said, well, who's my neighbor? And so he gives an illustration. But then he goes on and he says, now look, I command you to love one another. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you're definitely going to love your brother. Are you hearing me? Because Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And the number one indicator that a church is, is showing no spots is that there's no offense among the brethren. We cannot be at odds with one another. Even if something's happened, we're just quick to forgive. Are you hearing me? We can hash it out. We come to each other and say, what did dad say that you and I as his kids are supposed to do? And we'll receive the power of his word in this particular conflict we are currently ha having. Because again, I'm not to live with you based upon flesh and blood. I'm to live to with you based upon spirit and life. And so at the end of the day, it's easy for me to forgive you. It's easy for me to uh, apply God's word in our relationship so that we'll walk in love towards one another. And those who love God, obey his word. So the church, when he returns, there are going to be a unified group of people that are passionate about two things, loving God through obeying his word and secondly, applying that to one another, walking in love with one another, that you can't wait to get here. Now, you may not want to go to your natural family reunions, but you love coming to church. Are you hearing me? Because at the end of the day, we love each other. Just go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, I love you. Don't look at your wife. Don't look at your wife, because that's too easy. Get somebody else. Like, oh, I love you. Yeah, sure you do. <laughs> Look at somebody else. All right. So I want to take this uh, scripture just for a moment in De uh, Deuteronomy 11 and remind you of the blessings of obedience. I mean, I'm telling you right now, if the Bible had not uh, told us about all that comes with obeying, I mean, obeying, I mean, when God tells you what takes place when you obey, I don't know how this is like not number one on your list. It's like, I'll do that. I'll do that. I mean, this is not rocket science. Let me tell you how this is. It's so amazing. It's like, and it's, I mean, it's so exceeding. You can't, it can't even really fathom it. So really what I'm saying is going to almost be a mute point, but it at least it'll resonate enough that most of you be like, okay. And here's the thing. God is not asking you to obey him in something ungodly. Now it can be uncomfortable to your flesh, but his word is life. So it's kind of like this. You have a child or you're the child and your parent comes to you and says, listen, I want you to take out the trash. And if you'll take out the trash, I'll give you a million dollars. How fast you think you take the trash out? Now, trash stinks. Don't get me wrong. 
You got to take the time to go around every part of the house, clean it all up, and get it out. He wants it out of the house. And he's going to give you a million dollars. I mean, that's kind of like done. Every teenager in here like going to ask their parents, you give me a million dollars taking this trash out? <laughs> I mean, you understand, you say, well, nobody does. God does exceedingly abundantly beyond. When, when you obey him, I mean, the blessings are like, what? What do I get for doing this? Now, I'm not trying to manipulate God. He's just a good God. And God's not bribing me. He's like, it's just my nature. Because when you do my word, this is just what happens in my environment. This is just who I am. God's not trying to bribe you to do something. He's like, it just comes with obedience. And Deuteronomy 11 has some stuff in here that is awesome. Now, we could jump over to Deuteronomy 28, and we could read real quick some other stuff, too, on if you'll just do what I say. Like, why in the world would I not do that? This is because he, he'll follow up in 28 and say, now, if you don't do what I say, this will happen. I mean, and again, as simple as that is, Joshua actually has to come in his time and say, now, choose life. <laughs> I said before your life and death, choose life. So again, even in this age of the Lord where we are born again. Our spirit man is alive to God. We no longer have the guilt and shame of sin. It's been washed away. We're a whole new species of being. And now we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit lives in us. I mean, he's present with me and speaks to my spirit. Then he empowers me with the power to overcome the law of sin and death. Oh, my gosh. How easy is it for me to just say, yes, dad, I'll do that. Because when I do what you say, this comes with the territory. So obedience is the, the easiest thing. And here's the thing. Obedience will always be in play for all eternity. I said for all eternity. So we'll start in verse 1. Deuteronomy 11, 1. I like how he does this one. He says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and always, say always, always, always what? Keep. keep. So keep tells me that it's your responsibility, not God's. He tells you, and then it's your responsibility to keep it. And how often should you do it? Here we go. Because again, this first verse by itself, let me just read the whole verse and I'm going to come back just to this verse. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinance, and his commandments. Notice he says, in essence, he's saying, if you're loving me, this is what happens. Now, Jesus says this in John. He literally says this in John. If you love the Lord, you'll keep my word. If you love me, you keep my word. So you can't say I love you and not keep his word and God be convinced you love him. You don't get to define how you love God. God defines how you love him. And it's very clear. It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Although you'll feel. It is the function of obedience. That is loving God. So God says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God. And basically how? Always keep his charge, keep his statutes, keep his ordinances, and keep his commands. You're always to keep them. I said you're always to keep them. Now, the cool thing is, and again, even in this dispensation, it was available. It's even easier and more readily available in our dispensation. Although in our dispensation, we have the, a greater capacity of keeping it. Where in this one, they couldn't keep it because they were cut off. Their spirit man was dead. But in ours, we're alive. Are you hearing me? We're alive unto God so we can habitually keep. But if we do fail to keep, we have an advocate with the Father. The Holy Ghost will say, well, you didn't keep that. And you say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I didn't keep it. Forgive me. And he'll be quick to forgive you, cleanse you from that unrighteous act of doing something contrary to his word on how to handle that situation. And you'll get right back into right standing with God and can move on. 
Isn't that good news? That's good news. Don't have to walk around and beat myself up. I can just ask God to forgive me. He's acting like I didn't do it, and now I can be a doer or obey him at his word. Now, verse 2, know this day that I'm not speaking with your sons that have not known and who have not seen the discipline of your uh, the, of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arms, and his signs, and his works, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh the king, my gosh, or of Egypt, and to all his hand. Notice he's saying, I'm not talking to somebody who hasn't experienced my presence, my power, my signs, and my wonders. And I heard the Lord say to me this morning, he said, Anchor Faith Church knows the power of God, they've seen the sign. You can testify right now of all the miracles God's done in you. It's not like you don't know. And so in Deuteronomy 11, he's saying, listen, I'm talking to you about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in your neighbor as yourself. The reason I'm doing it, because I'm not talking to somebody who don't know. I mean, I'm not talking to a novice or someone inexperienced with the power of God. So I'm not talking to people who are inexperienced with the power of God this morning. I'm talking about people who have seen the miracles of God take place, signs and wonders take place. You've seen God move on behalf of impossible situations in your life, and you can testify, testify about them. Aren't you glad you can? And he goes on and then he recounts it more. And he says, and what he did to Egypt's army and to his horses and his chariots when he uh, made the water of the Red Sea engulf them while they were pursuing you and the Lord completely destroyed them. My gosh, he said, you know that the devil's defeated in your life. That's the new covenant equivalent to that. You know that the devil is defeated in your life. You understand when Moses is talking to this group, he said, I'm not talking to people that haven't seen, heard, experienced, and know Pharaoh is not showing up again. You watched him die. So I'm not talking to a group of people today that when you get under the power of God like you did today, you had the power of God, he's talking to you, the situation, you're already sensing it, and he said, now look, you know that the devil that's been trying to, he's already with, he really has no authority, and you know that. He cannot run you down. Neither any of his demons. They have no authority over you. They just have no authority. Then he goes on, verse 5, and he says, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place. What did he do? Well, their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell in their shoes. He provided food for them all the time. They watched their rebellious parents who got stiff-necked all the time and wouldn't listen, but yet God was merciful to them. God said, I'm going to take your kids in. You didn't think I could do it. I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and now here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Your parents are dead. And I'm bringing you in. And it's not like you don't know who I am. And, you, and it's not like you don't know what I can do to any enemy against you. Right? So he goes on and says, um, and what he did to these particular individuals, let's go on down to um, verse 7. But our own eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord, which he did. Then he says, verse 8, you shall therefore keep, say keep. Every commandment which I'm commanding you today, so that you may be what? My gosh. This is amazing. So what does he, if you'll do this, this is going to happen. Why in the world would obedience not be top priority of our lives? And it is. I said it is. You shall therefore keep every command which I am commanding you today, so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross in and possess it. So if you will be in obedience to God, you are guaranteed strength. If you feel weak, you have to check your obedience. 
Because if you're feeling weak, check your obedience. Yeah. Because he guarantees you obey me, you're going to be strong. You're going to be strong for every battle you're going to face. There's not a battle that you go, in essence, any conflict you have, you'll say, okay, well, there's the giant of my conflict. I am going to obey God in this situation because I'm going to be strong enough to conquer. And I already got the victory. Verse 9, the next so, so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to you. Are you seeing this? To your fathers to give them and to their descendants a land flowing milk and honey. So number one, you're going to be strong to conquer, but you're also going to have long days. You have extended life. You're guaranteed extended life. You're guaranteed to live as long as it's required for your purpose to be fulfilled. Because if God be for you. Verse 10. For the land into which you are entering to possess is not like the land of Egypt which you came from, where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land into which you are about to cross and to possess, a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which, my gosh, the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. Are you hearing what this is saying? In essence, when you obey God, he says, I guarantee your provision and your prosperity. I guarantee it. Because enough, when you're in Egypt, what you're doing, somebody else had a right to it. Because you were a slave there. They were making you work and you got very little of your labor. But when you enter in there, then you are going to, what you do put your hand to, I'm going to cause to prosper so exceedingly. Are you hearing me? And it all is from one simple principle. Just obey his word. Just obey his word. Just obey his word. It shall come about if, if. That's a conditional statement. So this is not a God problem. It's the child listening to the father and then keeping. Because it's a keeping problem. It's not even a hearing problem. It's a keeping problem. Because many people have heard, but they don't keep. And keeping is work. You got to keep yourself in self control. You got to keep your uh, anger off. You got to keep yourself uh, from being impatient. You got to keep yourself uh, 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 flowing in the fruits of the Spirit with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self control. You have to keep those things. It's your, you have to keep your flesh under, and you have to keep being led by the Spirit. But if you'll keep it, oh, my, my, my. I said, oh, my, my, my. He said, it shall come about if you listen obediently to my command, which I'm commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with what? All your heart and with all your soul, that he will what? Give the rain for your land in its season. Meaning, what you can't do, God says, I guarantee I'll do it. Because God's going to put you in places that you can't do it by yourself. You were never supposed to live naturally without God and make it. God was always going to take you to a place that by yourself you cannot do it. But God, you're a child of the king. You're the king. Of, you're a king of the king. And he cares for you. And he said, just do it this way. And you're like, yeah, dad, I'll do it that way. And boom. It had come to pass. And as you, but you have to do it with all your heart. I said all. And this is a problem. We got two variables here that we need to do self-examinations. One, are we keeping? And two, is it with all? Because if it's only when you're in trouble, then it's not all. It's, if it's only when a trial comes, then it's not all. It's not all. I said it's not all. You know, I, some people I begin to realize whether they're in the all state, all state, <laughs> not the insurance company, but whether they're in, in an all position, and it works a couple ways. One, they're always in church hearing the word, growing passionate, but then a trial comes 
a conflict, and then instead of coming and continuing to come, they get out. Because they start working it natural, and it gives them an excuse not to show up. Well, really, the word, a word for you is here. It will continue to strengthen your own personal growth so that you can go through. And next thing you know, the trial tribulation takes them out instead of them staying connected. Or there's the other one. The other one is everything's going good. You never see them. They decide when to come, what they want to do. It's not their whole heart, but when the problem comes. You, they're at the front door. I mean, they're the first one in the seat. And then once God, in his mercy, demonstrates how much he loves them, and he's like, man, and gets them out of that situation, then next thing you know, they're not here anymore until the next problem. In both cases, all is not theirs. So they love him. In essence, you could say it this. They love the Lord their God every time. That's how you should say it. And God didn't say, love the Lord your God every time you enter into a trial tribulation. Because every time sounds good. But all is no matter what the time. Because all is all. Whether it's good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm doing it. I'm serving. I obey him in every situation, circumstance. I'm all in, full of what God has for me. He goes, man, that your, your rain would come in its season, the early and late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and uh, your oil. Now, again, in the, in the art agricultural society, it's not enough to get the early rain. The early rain is what helped the seed take root so that it can begin to produce the plant that eventually will have some fruit on it. But fruit's no good until it ripens. So the latter rain is to mature the crop so you actually get a harvest. Because if the, if the latter rain doesn't come, it doesn't matter you have a plant and some fruit on it, they won't be mature or ripe to pick. And if you pick something that's not ripe, it doesn't taste good. It's in essence as if you don't even have one. So many people start with God, but because they don't love him with all, they don't get the latter rain of God. Are you hearing me? You've got to start and finish. You've got to love God all from the beginning to the end, which means there are certain things in our life that has processes. It just is a process. But if you'll tend to your seed, to the word, and keep it in front of you, then you'll get the latter rain and you'll get the fruit of that seed. He goes on and says this, beware that your hearts are not deceived. Uh, verse 15, he will give grass in your field, your cattle, and they'll eat and be satisfied. In essence, he's doing the provision you need that you can't get on in yourself. Verse 16, beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Notice this is the opposite side of obedience happening now. In essence, once you get into this place and you're keeping my word and I'm doing what I said I would do as a result of your obedience, don't be deceived to think you did it and then turn your attention somewhere else. Are you hearing me? Because if you start turning your attention somewhere else, the all isn't happening anymore. And you're making choices and you're putting the blessings of God you understand the blessings of God can become idolatry. Well, you'll begin to worship those things. In essence, you'll give more attention to it. Look how God's blessed my business. Now that your business is so big, you don't have time to come to church. You've got so much cash flow happening. You know, you've worked so hard. Now you're going to take time off and you take time off from church, but yet you go on all kinds of vacations. You buy other toys that God has blessed you with that, but now you're on the toys more than you are in the presence of God. And he said, don't be deceived this way because if you do this, if you start making the blessings become your object, well, 
anger starts to show up and is kindled against you. And he said he'll shut up the heavens so that there'll be no rain, or which means you'll get to a place that all of a sudden you get yourself in a tough season that God never intended for you. Because obedience is always in play. Are you hearing me? I said obedience is always in play. Obedience is always in play. I said obedience is always in play. Verse 27 of Deuteronomy 11. It says, the blessing, if you listen to the command of the Lord your God, which I'm commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commands of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today and follow after other gods which you have not known. So again, even in this age, under grace, grace didn't even happen in your life till you first obeyed because faith had to be in play. Faith comes from Hearing and our faith comes from the hearing of the word of God. So we heard God's word that we needed Jesus as our Lord. He paid the price for our sin. We then believe with all of our heart that he was the only way to the Father. We confessed him with our mouth. We repented of our way of doing. And through that confession of faith, that obedient act, Grace manifested in our lives and gave us what we didn't deserve prior to, which was sonship. Although we were always originally destined to be son. But because of our rebellion, our disobedience, we deserve the lake of fire. But when we obey God's provision, his substitute, his king that was slain so that we could become a king like him, then in obedience, God, through his grace, allowed sonship to show back up. Once sonship showed back up, then he gave us another measure of grace that now empowers us to not sin like Jesus didn't sin. Because we have now the Holy Spirit on the inside of us who, has, who speaks to our spirit and says, you can obey. You can do it. You can live in a perpetual state of obedience. And how do you grow in obeying God? You renew your mind. And your mind wants to do what the Spirit's doing. It does when you're in the Word. But if you're not in the Word, then other voices will talk, and you're very familiar with that. And you'll start feeding your flesh, feeding your own desires, which are directly opposed to God, which puts you back in rebellion or disobedience, and then problems occur. But aren't you glad that God says, I'm giving you power to obey? Isn't that amazing? God made me to obey, not made me to go to heaven. He made me a new creature in Christ so I can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because every time I do your will, then I have what comes with it. Life. This is very simple. Very simple. This is why Paul said, you got to crucify that flesh. So 1 Samuel 15 says it this way. A couple scriptures and we'll close. 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23. So Samuel said... Has the Lord, I'm reading out the New King James, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Can we be forgiven if we don't obey? Yes. But what's he saying? I really don't want to have to forgive you because if you just obey me, there's no reason for you to have to receive forgiveness. In fact, this issue was with King Saul and God gave him a word of what to do, but he did not obey it. In essence, he sacrificed instead. And the sacrifice God did not receive because it wasn't how God told him to do something. Now, in life, we're going to sacrifice 
And what do we sacrifice? Our will. I keep it on the altar daily. It's not my will, but your will. It's not my will, but your will. And I know if I do his will, I got the blessings. I said, I got the blessings. Because even when trouble comes because of my righteousness, I'm going to overcome. Because God delivers the righteous out of all their trouble. He's even merciful when I put the trouble on myself. I get it. But I don't want to be that Christian that I'm always asking for forgiveness. You know that term. Well, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. No, it's better to get permission. Go ahead and get permission. Because when you get permission, there's no reason to have to be and when someone says that, well, you know, you can just always ask for forgiveness. Well, you already know there's a problem because you're anticipating someone's going to say, why did you do it this way? Oh, I'm sorry. For, well, you could avoid that if you just got the permission. And a lot of times we will because we want to do it and we already perceive that they're not going to want to do it our way. But we want to do it our way so bad. In the kingdom, the king is right. He is the word. He is life. And you save yourself a lot of conflict if you just say, now, Lord, what's your way? What does your word say about it? Give me your word. Because in your word, there's life. I said there's life. And you understand, you avoid a lot of awkward personal moments of the forgiving part. Because you know, when you get into the part that you need forgiveness, the enemy really works hard on you. He'll start to condemn you, make you feel guilty. You know, you don't deserve to go down there. I am really amazed at how a born again believer can get so hard with God that before they were ever right with God and they knew how uh, much they needed the Lord and all the junk they brought, but they heard Jesus died for them, and they, were, they threw all that off to accept Jesus as Lord. We well, understand you can't be that bad anymore. I mean, you're only going to get that bad if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I mean, God is very merciful to his kids. So why do you let the devil pound on you? Shake it off fast. Go on down, run. But you've got to condition yourself through the renewing of your mind, that I'm actually obey. I mean, do you want to hold on to rebellion? Do you want to hold on to it? If you do, then rebel against the devil. I mean, since you're so trained in rebellion anyway, before you came to God, go ahead and take that rebellion against your old dad. Why carry your rebellion into the dad that saved you? I mean, if you want to hold on a little, well, I, sometime I just like to rebel. Well, go ahead and rebel against the devil. Go ahead and say, I ain't coming back. Oh, you want me to I ain't coming. I ain't coming. He can't tell me what to do. Go ahead and keep that attitude with the devil. Go ahead and keep that attitude with the devil. I ain't coming back. I'm not cussing anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. No, I ain't going to do it. I rebel against you. I rebel against you till Jesus comes. I'm always in rebellion against you. I just rebel against you. I mean, if you got to keep rebellion, rebel against the devil, which means then you'll be in obedience to God. If you submit to God, you'll, you will be resisting the devil. Amen. So if there's something about rebellion you like, rebel against the devil. Don't bring it over here and decide, maybe I don't want to do what God says. That's stupidity. Go, go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, don't be stupid. Amen. Pastor Craig has a good book called Don't Be Stupid. So he goes on and says in verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We've made, you know, the world has made that word like it's cool. See, I, I did this in youth ministry. I mean, and I would do it with adults as well. You know, obviously, when you get into sexual immorality and you're trying to be with someone that's not your spouse, especially teens dating, they're like, man, I love you. 
I just want to be with you. I just want to make love to you. I mean, it sounds super cool, and then you get this slow jazz going, you know, or some song that's <laughs> up in the mood. It sounds good, all right? But if you actually said it with the Lord, girl, I, I just want to fornicate tonight. I mean, there's nothing that rolls off. The, there's nothing French about that, right? I mean, it's like, what? Yeah, I think we should fornicate. Nothing sounds great about that. So we use these other terms to make it sound good. Well, why don't we do this with rebellion? Ah, oh, you're practicing witchcraft. This is cool. Oh, I didn't realize you were into witchcraft. And you don't sound as cool, right? Now I just do what I want to do. I understand. You know, nobody can tell me what to do. Okay, I'm glad you're practicing witchcraft. Cool. Unlike the movies, the witches don't win. They never win. <laughs> so rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. So stubbornness, oh, I didn't realize you were an idol worship. I don't worship no idol. I ain't got no little figurine, but you are the figurine. Because you're worshiping your idea. You're worshiping your way of doing it. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. He goes on and says, but you have rejected the word of the Lord. So here it is. It tells you real quick. You've rejected the word of the Lord. And he's rejected you from being. Now that's important. Because. Although King Saul is a natural king, we are a king of the king. And you don't want God, the king, to reject you as a king. And you can have be rejected as a king of the king if you're practicing witchcraft and idolatry, which is rebellion and stubbornness. Now, how quick can you break off stubbornness? It's very fast. These are not hard things. These are easy, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This is easy stuff. It really is. The devil makes you think it's hard. It's not hard. It's easy because the, the anointing, is, it is the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God. There is no sin, no nothing that can't, God can't break, destroy, rip off, put, make it look like it wasn't even part of your life. I mean, he'll strip it so much that it's into the sea of forgetfulness. I mean, that's how quick God is on this stuff. The power of God's blood is amazing. If you just renew your mind to be obedient, you will walk in the freedom of that. Which brings me to Hebrews chapter 10, our last scripture today is this, 35 through 39. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. What is my confidence? First John tells us this is the confidence that we have. If we hear anything according to his will, if we hear anything, if we say anything according to his will, we know that he hears us, and we have that which we've asked for. So I don't throw my confidence away. Why? Because I'm just going to obey God. Because when I obey God, guess what? It has great reward. Say great reward. great reward. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not. Say, we are not. Yeah. Come on, say, we are not. Yeah. Say, we are not. Yeah. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of our soul. And I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost was being poured out today because he wants to remind you, look, it's easy for me to uh, uh, heal you. It's easy for me to deliver you. It's easy for me to be able to do these things in your life. It's easy for me to lift your burden, to tear it off, to touch you, to forgive you, to treat you like you've never done it. I mean, I want you to think of me as if you've never had a conflict with me. That's how I look at you. So don't shrink back. Don't do it. 
Don't rebel. Don't be stubborn. There's great reward. For those who obey him, and we are to obey him today, we are to do him at, at his word, we are to trust him at his word, we are to live his word, we are to crucify our flesh, we are to live by the spirit, we are to live by faith, and that is on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when we do it, we have guaranteed success. Provision. Are you hearing me? Protection. Supply. Health and healing. I mean, the rewards of obedience are so amazing. I mean, I just wake up every day saying, Lord, I'm so excited I get to obey you today. I get to do what you ask. Say anything, God. There's great reward with your voice. And it's easy because my spirit is in your likeness. And Jesus always said, yes, Lord. I only do what the Father says. And if it was, if it, if Jesus had the capacity to always be in right standing with the Father, then guess what? We're the same. I said we're the same. How do you accelerate an obedient type of life? You got to be in the Word. You got to be in the Word. Because then you know His will and you know how to respond.